In this video, I'll be going through the 2023 mechanics paper. Question 1. The following diagram shows the layout of a softball game. A stationary player accelerates from home plate to first base, the player takes 6.61 seconds to get to first base, and arrives moving at 5.45 meters per second. Show that the average acceleration is 0.825 meters per second per second. Our average acceleration is our change in velocity divided by the duration over which it changed, because we know that the player started out stationary and reached a velocity of 5.45 meters per second. Our change in velocity is just 5.45, and our duration is our 6.61, which indeed gives me 0.825 meters per second per second to three significant figures. Calculate the maximum displacement between the home plate and first base. First of all, let's write down what we know. We know that our initial velocity is zero. We know that our final velocity is our 5.45. We know our acceleration is 0.825. And we know our time is 6.61. What we're trying to find is our distance. And so for this situation, because we have all four of these quantities, we can choose any of our kinematic equations, provided that it has distance. I'm going to choose what I think is the simplest one, which is d equals vi plus vf divided by 2 multiplied by t. Since we know that vi is 0, this just becomes vft divided by 2. Putting in our numbers gives me 18.0 meters to three significant figures. Why might this displacement be different from the actual distance travelled by the player? What we've assumed is that the player goes in a straight line from home plate to first base, when in reality they might have taken a longer path. The player may not have travelled in a straight line. The softball has a mass of 0.180 kilograms, is thrown at 44.4 metres per second, and is caught and brought to a stop at first base. The catcher's arm is relaxed, and the ball and padded glove move backwards a little once the ball collides with the padded glove. The ball takes 0.510 seconds to stop. This results in an impulse. What does the term impulse mean? The term impulse means a change in momentum. Calculate the average force of the ball on the padded glove on impact. To do this, we can use the equation that the change in momentum is equal to the force times the duration over which it changed, solving for force by dividing both sides by the duration and swapping them around. We know our duration, that's our 0.510 seconds, but we don't yet know our change in momentum. Because our softball goes to a stop, our change in momentum is just going to be our initial momentum, which is mass times velocity, where our mass is 0.180, and our velocity is 44.4, which gives me 8 kilogram meters per second. Putting that number in, gives me 15.7 newtons to three significant figures. Use physics principles to explain the advantages of catching a ball using a relaxed arm and a padded glove. A relaxed arm and padded glove are able to move slash compress with the ball, increasing the duration over which the momentum changes. As f equals delta p over delta t, and delta p is constant, increasing delta t decreases f. This reduces the risk of injury. Later in the game, a 50 kilogram player moving to the right at speed v collides with a 60 kilogram player who is moving to the left at 0.4 meters per second. The two players collide and stick together and move to the right at 2 meters per second after the collision. What physical quantity is assumed to be conserved during the collision? In collisions, provided there are no external forces, we can assume conservation of momentum. Calculate the initial speed v of the 50 kilogram player. To do this, we can start with the statement that the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. Recalling that our momentum is mass times velocity, our momentum initially is our mass of 50 kilograms multiplied by our unknown speed v. Now we need to think about positives and negatives. For simplicity, we'll make this direction positive, which means that this direction is negative. 
and so the momentum of our 60 kilogram player before the collision is his mass of 60 kilograms times his velocity of 0.4. After the collision they move together, meaning that they have a combined mass, and they move with a velocity of 2 meters per second. All that's needed now is to solve this equation for V. My first step is to add 60 times 0.4 to both sides, and finally to divide both sides by 50. 4.88 meters per second to three significant figures. Question two, a player with a mass of 55 kilograms, moving at a constant speed of seven meters per second, follows a circular path as they round second base. The radius of their circular path is 15 meters. Calculate the centripetal force acting on the player as they round the base. The equation for centripetal force is mass times velocity squared divided by radius, where we have all of these values which gives me 180 newtons to three significant figures. Add labeled arrows to the diagram below to show the direction of the force, acceleration, and velocity of the player. The centripetal force and centripetal acceleration are both towards the center, and the velocity is always at a tangent. Name the force that supplies the centripetal force acting on the player as they move in a circle. That is the friction force between the player's shoes and the ground. Explain why the player can be moving at a constant speed and yet be accelerating at the same time. As velocity is a vector, it has both size and direction. Since the direction of the velocity changes, even though the size does not, the velocity is changing. Acceleration is change in velocity, so the player is accelerating. The player runs onto a large slippery muddy patch while rounding the base. Describe and explain fully, using physics principles, the effects the slippery mud will have on the player's motion. The muddy ground will reduce the friction force the player is able to attain. If this is less than the centripetal force required for the player to move around the base, the player will no longer accelerate towards the center. They will instead move in the direction of their tangential velocity. Question 3. The next batter hits the ball up in the air with an initial velocity of 22.0 meters per second at an angle of 35 degrees. Show that the vertical component of the initial velocity of the ball is 12.6 meters per second. So if we have our 22 meters per second, that forms the hypotenuse of our triangle here, where this is our right angle. Our vertical component is opposite the angle, so we need to use the SO relationship in Sokotoa. That is, that sine of our angle, which is 35 degrees, is equal to the opposite that we're trying to find, our vertical component of our velocity, divided by the hypotenuse, which is our 22 meters per second. Solving this for velocity by multiplying both sides by 22 and swapping them around, gives me 12.6 meters per second to three significant figures, which is what we're trying to find. If you get anything else, check that your calculator is in degrees. Calculate the maximum height reached by the ball above the ground. What we can do is first find the height that the ball reached above the player, and then add on our 1.6 meters. Looking at the vertical motion, we know that our initial velocity is 12.6 meters per second, we know that at the maximum height, our final velocity is zero. Our acceleration is our acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second per second. And we need to be careful with positives and negatives. So I'm gonna make upwards positive and downwards negative. Our initial velocity points up, so it's positive, And our acceleration points down, so it's negative. What we're trying to find is our distance. The equation with all of these values is Vf squared equals Vi squared plus 2ad. We know that Vf is 0 and 0 squared is 0, so we can just make this 0. And we just need to solve this for d. My first step is to subtract Vi squared from both sides, and we'll swap them around. And then to divide both sides by 2a. Putting our numbers in gives me 8.1 meters. Now our total height is going to be our 8.1 plus the height of our player, which is 1.6. 
which gives me 9.7 meters. The ball's motion can be tracked and can be shown as the parabola motion below. Use physics principles to fully explain the motion of the ball from the time it leaves the bat until it hits the ground. Add labelled arrows of appropriate length to show the forces on the ball at A leaves the bat, B maximum height, and C just before it hits the ground. Our assumption for projectile motion is that the only force acting is gravity, so we need to draw three gravity vectors of the same size pointing down. Describe and explain how the forces, acceleration and horizontal and vertical velocities of the ball change throughout its flight. The only force acting is gravity downwards, its value does not change. There is no force in the horizontal direction. The only acceleration is downward due to gravity, its value does not change, there is no horizontal acceleration. The horizontal velocity is constant. As for the vertical velocity, it's initially 12.6 meters per second upward, reduces to zero at the max height, and then increases in the downwards direction. The 110 kilogram coach and a substitute player of 74 kilograms sit on a uniform bench. The mass of the bench is 40 kilograms. On the above diagram, add arrows to show all of the forces acting on the bench. We have our downwards weight forces of our coach and player. We have the upwards forces from our two supports and our weight force from the bench itself, which acts from its middle. By calculating torques about support B or otherwise, determine the values of the support forces at A and B. Firstly, I'm going to use the fact that the torques must be equal to determine the value of one of our supports. It doesn't really matter which way around you do this. For no particular reason, I'm going to find support B. And to do so, I need to make support A my pivot. When I do this, this means that the force at support A is at a distance of zero, and so it produces no torque about this point. And so in the equation that I'm now about to make, the only unknown is going to be the force from support B. Our first statement is that the torques in the counterclockwise direction must equal the torques in the clockwise direction. Since we have made our pivot at support A, this force here produces a counterclockwise torque, as does our force about support B. Our weight force from the beam produces a clockwise torque, as does the weight force from our player. Putting those torques into our equation, we have the torque from our coach, plus the torque from our support at B, and our clockwise torques is the torque from our bench, and for this I'll use a lowercase b, plus the torque from our player. Now we know that torque is equal to force times distance, or in other words, distance times force. So I'm gonna replace each of these torques with their distance times their force. The torque from our coach is at a distance of 0.35 meters. And because this force is a weight force and the weight force is equal to mass times gravity, we know the weight force of the coach is their mass of 110 multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.8. Adding on the torque of our support B, which is a distance of 0.6 meters away, and we'll just leave this as FB since this is the unknown we're trying to find. We know that all of this is equal to the torque from our bench, which is at a distance of half of the distance between our supports, so 0.3. And because it is likewise a weight force, that force is just going to be our mass of 40 kilograms multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity 9.8. And finally, the torque from our player is going to be their distance, which is going to be 0.6 plus 0.420, which is 1.02. And their weight force is their mass, which is 74 times the acceleration due to gravity 9.8. Now to solve this big ugly thing for FB, I'm first going to subtract this from both sides and divide both sides by 0 0.6. Whereas 0 0.6 cancels out on this side and we just need to put this into our calculator, which gives me 800 newtons. Now to find the force from our support A, 
we don't need to use the torques again, we can instead use our second equilibrium condition, which is that the net force is equal to zero, where in this case, that means that the up forces equal the down forces, where our up forces are from our supports, and our down forces are from our weight forces. Solving this for FA by subtracting FB from both sides, for our weight forces, we know that they're just their masses times the acceleration due to gravity. And our force from support B was just our 800, which gives me 1,400 newtons to three significant figures. And we're done.